Good evening and welcome to the public lecture series in the Department of Architecture at MIT. I'm John Oxendorf, Professor of Architecture and Civil and Environmental Engineering. And on behalf of the Building Technology Program and the Department of Architecture, we're delighted to welcome you to tonight's lecture with Donnell Baird, who's the founder and CEO of Block Power, a Brooklyn-based startup that's making waves all over the world now. And uh, we're just delighted to have Donnell here tonight to share his work at uh, reducing uh, energy demand, saving money, and uh, creating low carbon cities of the future. For those of you who don't know Block Power, it's a Brooklyn-based climate technology startup that's making cities greener, smarter, and healthier. And although at MIT, we've done a lot of work on building technology and building energy models and neighborhood models, the one piece that we are not doing enough on, I have to say, is around financing and capital. And the extraordinary thing about Block Power from our perspective is how the emphasis on uh, greening cities and communities is also focusing on, on the financing and on uh, putting money back into to people's pockets and also finding, finding ways for investors to support this green energy revolution. So uh, just a little bit of background, Donnell's graduated from Duke University, worked as a community organizer and, and job, green job creation uh, as a consultant to the Obama administration and worked with a number of labor unions. He left the public sector about a decade ago and, and uh, he has an MBA from Columbia University. And it, we, we were really fortunate to have a conversation earlier this afternoon with some of our graduate students in building technology. And it reminded me his focus on, on financial models that are going to create green cities in the future reminded me of a lecture we had at MIT almost 20 years ago when just after 9-11, when the, the towers came down, the chief structural engineer, Leslie Robertson, came and spoke to our community. And it was still a very raw and emotional moment for all of us. And Les Robertson said something to that room of students that there was an audible gasp in the room. Les said, we build buildings to make money. And you know, this was, this was hard for a depart school of architecture at the time to, to think about or, or grasp because it's not something we talk a lot about in school. But as we think about the changes that we need to see in the coming months, years, and uh, let's just say decade to address the, the climate emergency, uh, it is really going to be about financing and bringing communities together to, uh, to create this low carbon future. Uh, Donnell is also joined by his colleagues who uh, are uh, both his, his CFO, Colin Kosunik, and Bradley Tran, uh, who works in product development with Block Power. So we'll have a brief presentation, and then we'll have a Q&A with my colleague, Christoph Reinhardt, who's also working on, on building energy modeling and uh, lower carbon cities. So with that, uh, a very warm virtual welcome from Las Vegas to a hero for the planet, Donnell Baird, welcome. Uh, hi everybody, um, thanks so much for the wonderful introduction. Um, I'm from New York and so building buildings to make money is something that a lot of people focus on down here. So that, that's interesting. Um, maybe they pretend to do other things as well. Um, I have some slides which I can use to walk through a conversation about how block power thinks about environmental justice, if that's interesting. Um, so I can share my screen and walk through those for a few minutes, um, if that's helpful. John, does that make sense? Yeah, that would be great. Thanks. I should have done that earlier, obviously. Um, but super excited to be here with all of you today. Um, a huge fan of MIT, one of my very best friends in the world, um, is a professor um, of urban studies at MIT, Dr. Mariana Arcaya. Um, she's the person who taught me about climate change, who forced me to take a class on climate change, who forced me to watch An Inconvenient Truth that Al Gore, Vice President Al Gore had um, put out um, in the early 2000s and um, really started me on my journey. Has been a great friend and mentor and advisor to me. Um, and she is at MIT. And so I'm always excited to have the chance um, to talk with the MIT community, although I have a little bit of a challenge for you 
which we'll get into in about 10 minutes. So let me, let me first walk you through how we think about um, environmental justice. All right, so um, at Block Power, our core hypothesis is that we can turn 5 million buildings into Teslas, meaning we can make these buildings electric, smart, healthy, with no fossil fuels. And we can accomplish this in the communities that are most in need of environmental justice. And so that all sounds great. What makes this difficult? So if you look at small and medium enterprise buildings across America, there's 5 million of them about 120 million residential buildings, about two to 300,000 skyscrapers across the country. Um, the medium-sized buildings, schools, apartment complexes, uh, churches, synagogues, mosques, community buildings, small businesses, they waste about $100 billion of energy where folks pay for fossil fuels and kind of consume them, but are inefficient in the way that they consume them. So they, we waste a bunch of billions and billions of dollars paying for fossil fuels that we don't really need. Um, the buildings spread COVID-19 and asthma. The buildings emit about 7% of US greenhouse gas emissions. And so upgrading these 5 million buildings as well as the other 125 million homes, it's a massive opportunity. Um, and interestingly enough, during the Trump administration, uh, a lot of local leaders kind of finally woke up and realized the Trump administration and the federal government is not going to be the answer or provide any solutions on climate change. In fact, quite the opposite. And so if any progress is going to be made on climate change, it had to happen at the local level. And so hundreds and hundreds of cities across America, this is outdated, I think it's like over 200 cities at this point. Um, have passed laws indicating that in that city um, there will be a hundred percent renewable energy and uh, 40, 50, 80, 100 percent greenhouse gas emissions reductions in hundreds of cities around America. And so all of that occurred during the four years of the Trump administration um, as local leaders started to take more and more responsibility for climate action and greenhouse gas reduction. So this is going to cost over a trillion dollars to put in sustainability upgrades in 5 million buildings and several trillion dollars more um, to install sustainability upgrades in over 100 million buildings across America. A venture capital firm, Fifth Wall, recently said that it's going to cost between 18 and 36 trillion dollars to green the real estate industry more globally, which is a massive amount of money. Um, and so we got to get to work. <clears throat> The challenge is the process of decarbonizing buildings or electrifying buildings or doing energy efficiency optimizations in buildings, it's too complicated, it's too complex, too manual, it's too expensive. An individual building owner shown here in the center of our slide, mom and a pop, they have to, they gotta talk to a mechanical engineering firm, electrical engineering firm. You gotta talk to a construction contractor and installation company. They have to negotiate the size of, and brand and manufacture of equipment, warranties and all that stuff, um, and technology and hardware that goes into the building. They have to figure that out. Um, contractors are incentivized to, to sell hardware that they get referral fees. And so contractors aren't you know, um, non-biased sources of information on what technology should go into your building because they're just going to sell you whatever is going to pay them the most money in terms of their referral fee. So in order to get a neutral recommendation of what makes your building sustainable, you need to talk to your engineer, you need to talk to various manufacturers and suppliers to negotiate warranties and discounts, a lot of complications there. Then in order to finance the project, if you don't have 50000 or $500,000 laying around to finance your sustainability upgrade, you'll need to borrow capital from a bank or a lender who is gonna review the engineering report, review the construction assessment and scope of work, review the equipment specifications and decide whether or not to make a loan. And if they do, then you gotta get permission from the utility company and you gotta get permission from the local government. 
and you may need to get some incentives from the local government and utility as well. So the point is this mom and pop have to talk to six, seven, 12 uh, different service providers, negotiate individual transactions, and then combine them into one central transaction that can be financed and project managed. And that's just too much work for any mom and pop. Um, and it's too much work for most building owners across America. So it's too difficult right now to green buildings. And so that has to be solved. In low and moderate income communities, we know that the energy systems um, create outsized energy waste. They strain the utility grid. They emit greenhouse gas emissions and they produce chronic asthma in all the families that live there. And so you have a little bit of a vicious cycle of energy poverty. You have low income households that cannot afford to retrofit their building with sustainability renovations. Therefore, their buildings are hyper inefficient because they're neglected and they have higher than average um, energy utilization per square foot. Um, so it turns out that the very wealthiest buildings and the very poorest buildings are hyper consumers of energy. Um, and so these inefficient neglected buildings have really high uh, rates of energy waste and energy consumption and fossil fuels. And then of course, their energy bills are sky high because they're consuming so much energy. And then because their energy bills are sky high, they have less money to invest in other things, including energy upgrades. So things just spiral, get worse and worse, um, cause chronic asthma, um, waste 20 to 75% of the uh, energy that's consumed. Um, there's very little software, there's very little data. What data there is is unstructured and uncaptured and it's just a giant mess. So how do we fix all this? At Block Power, we've built a unified software platform to decarbonize buildings. So we wanna engineer and analyze and finance and underwrite and upgrade green buildings across America. So we do that by identifying, financing and upgrading each building. Our technology identifies upgrades in millions of buildings. Um, we source capital from Wall Street and Silicon Valley to invest in greening buildings and covering the upfront costs that low income customers cannot afford to pay. And then we work to project manage local installation firms to install um, the smart green all electric equipment that needs to be installed in each and every building. So our platform analyzes, scores, finances, and installs building electrification, decarbonization, and energy efficiency projects. So the specifics of how we do it is through the software platform using cloud machine learning, mobile computing, internet of things to reduce transaction costs. We've built predictive models and statistical models and machine learning, by building archetype, um, which archetypes require what kind of clean energy equipment um, and where our software is able to target and make recommendations for clean energy upgrades, um, which help building owners to understand what's possible in terms of their building. Then we created a new financial product with Goldman Sachs, where we purchase clean energy equipment and lease it to building owners over 15 years. And we try to save them money while we do that. So for example, here, a seven unit residential building in the Bronx with an oil burning heating system and hot water system, we're gonna rip all that out and replace it with an electric air source heat pump, electric hot water pump and some insulation. The customer is actually gonna save eight to 15% on their energy bills net of repaying us for our loan or for our lease. So we're gonna lend them some money. They have to make a payment back to us, but we're saving them so much money on their energy bill that they're still gonna see an eight to 15% savings relative to what they're paying for their energy costs now. So we want it to be profitable for folks to decarbonize their buildings in low-income communities and in middle-class communities and everywhere else. We think that's necessary. And investors like Goldman can make anywhere from seven to 15% financial returns on their investment um, because again, these buildings are so inefficient. So we think electrified HVAC heating and cooling systems 
are a way to solve health equity and provide environmental justice in low-income communities because they make buildings greener, smarter, and healthier by reducing air pollution. You're making the building healthier, healthier and saving money. And so electrification is an environmental justice measure. We're gonna partner with national construction and installation firms. So we actually partner with Mitsubishi and Daikon nationally. Um, we wanna train veteran, woman, minority owned, uh, small construction firms to complete projects for us using our project management system. Um, using our software and financing and processes operationally, we've been able to reduce transactional costs, the cost of greening buildings in New York City by as high as 90%. So now that we've figured out how to do this, we think that we can help green buildings across America. We can help buildings that want sustainability renovations across America to complete green transactions and we can finance those transactions. So we are greening the dangerous urban infrastructure of America by streamlining the engineering and construction and finance. Um, and we think, we think it's important, but why, do, why might other people think it's really important? So from a health equity standpoint, if you stay with the Bronx where we've greened our seven unit building, that we're saving eight to 15%. That's important because 20% of kids in the Bronx have asthma. 3% of people in the Bronx go to the emergency room each year due to asthma attack. That means 3% of every single person in the Bronx goes to the emergency room with an asthma attack. It's not that they have an asthma attack, is that they have an asthma attack and they have to go to the emergency room. So that's 3% of everyone in the, in the Bronx. This is 78% higher than the rest of New York City, 180% higher than New York State. New York City is not a healthy place. I mean, everybody has asthma, the air quality is terrible, but the Bronx is far more terrible than any place else in New York. And it's the worst place in the country. There's three times the amount of deaths in the Bronx from asthma than on average in the United States and five times the amount of hospitalization in the Bronx. And so here's some data that we got from the healthcare system in the Bronx. They figured out which parts of the Bronx had the highest rates of chronic asthma and emergency room visits. And it actually turned out that there's a bunch of several hundred buildings in the Bronx that are making everyone who lives there sick and sending everybody to the emergency room with chronic asthma. It's because their heating and cooling systems look like this. They have old building energy and ventilation systems that waste energy, that trap air pollution, that sicken the Bronx residents. So this, this burns, I think this one burns oil. Uh, I can't tell from the picture, maybe it burns gas. Either way, it's combusting uh, fossil fuels in the basement, releasing releasing indoor air pollution that's being recirculated around the building. Uh, people are breathing it inside the building. Some of it's also going out of the building and becoming local pollution, smog, what have you. And so there's 10,000 of these buildings that burn oil in New York City. 5,000 apartment buildings in the Bronx burn oil. And so they burn oil 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year because they're burning oil to produce hot water that is used for cooking and cleaning and showering and to produce heat in the winter. And so there's just a ton of oil being con combusted in the Bronx and everyone's breathing it in. And that's why they have really high asthma attack. And then there's other sources of asthma. There's uh, exhaust from the local trucks. Um, the Bronx is a food distribution hub. And so there's a lot of trucks that come in from New Jersey and all over New York and Connecticut to pick up food, drop off food at a bunch of food warehouses in the Bronx and they idle their trucks. And so all the exhaust also contributes to smog, but the ventilation systems in the Bronx in the buildings are so poor that they ingest the air, don't clean it, and then everybody breathes in it. So it's a mess. <clears throat> so during COVID-19, vulnerable populations in the Bronx had among the highest comorbidity rates for COVID um, of anywhere in America during the pandemic. A lot of New York City's essential workers, a lot of nurses live in the Bronx. 
They had the highest rates of COVID infections in NYC, in the Bronx. And of course, NYC had high, higher rates in most parts of the country. The Bronx has the poorest congressional district in the country. I think AOC represents part of it or all of, uh, I'm not totally sure. I don't think it's her district. I think it's um, Torres' district. Um, but she's got some tough neighborhoods as well. Um, and there's high rates of asthma, diabetes, and hypertension. So what we do is we want to go into the Bronx and identify, finance, and upgrade all of the buildings so that they can access clean energy technology so that we can overhaul the current uh, environmental injustices that are occurring in the Bronx and convert the Bronx to one of the greenest, healthiest, happiest, smartest um, places in America. That's what we're about. So our solutions are working. We've completed over a thousand projects and those are mostly apartment buildings. So there's 10, 20,000 families whose lives we've impacted because we've greened their buildings. Um, um, and one of the things that uh, we think is interesting is there, there's a Times article about how urban planning um, and redlining um, means that redlined communities that haven't been able to access capital historically from Wall Street and banks, those communities are literally hotter, like they're several degrees hotter, warmer um, than the surrounding community because of the lack of infrastructure in these communities. And so there's like lots of heat stroke and heat death um, in poor communities because they're like literally hotter. The buildings are literally hotter. Um, so we're really interested um, in a joint environmental justice campaign with you guys at MIT. Um, you know, I think with regard to climate change, the time for like lectures is past. The time for United Nations negotiations about whether or not we're gonna ban coal or I don't know what we're doing. Um, all that time has passed. Like it is time to decarbonize buildings at scale. There is existing hardware, heat pumps, geothermal that allows us to decarbonize buildings. We can decarbonize every building in America. We damn sure can decarbonize every building in Cambridge. And so what's interesting to me is for you guys to use all of the brain power and resources and endowment and technical acumen that you guys have to make a commitment to figure out how to decarbonize at least 5,000 buildings in Cambridge. I think it'd be amazing if you guys let a commitment to decarbonize the entire city of Cambridge. This is not pie in the sky. Ithaca, New York, uh, where Cornell University is located, they have pledged to decarbonize every building in the city of Ithaca, New York. So there's 6,000 buildings and they're gonna decarbonize every last one of them. And they've hired Block Power to lead that decarbonization program. You guys don't have to hire us, but you should decarbonize Cambridge as the leading technical university in the country, if not the world. We think that it's high time that you guys think about how to use your vast talent and resources um, to lead decarbonization in America or else Cornell is gonna blow by you. Um, and so one of the things we're working on is it's gonna be announced in a week or two that we're building a digital map of buildings of 125, 126 million, I don't know if Bradley has the exact number, uh, buildings across America in partnership with DOE, um, and uh, Zillow and um, a few other folks, hopefully Apple and Google um, and Amazon, we are gonna build digital models of um, 100 million buildings across America and um, give each of them a free plan for how they can decarbonize those buildings using our predictive modeling and data. So we'd love your help with that. And we think generally that public-private partnerships, you know, we, I don't think that the United States Senate is in a place or even the United States Congress is in a place to pass the kinds of aggressive legislation that's needed to decarbonize America. So it's gonna have to be the universities, the tech companies and the private sector who show up um, to partner with local governments and state governments and with the White House doing what they can in order to generate public private partnerships that are gonna decarbonize cities and the entire country at scale. So I think that's what's necessary. Um, 
one of the things that's interesting is once our data set is fully organized and analyzed, we believe that utilities, governments, building owners, construction companies, insurance companies are going to use our block power sustainability scores to kind of price and size their transactions, almost like a FICO score or a miles per gallon score when you buy a car or a car fax report, if you're buying a used car, like what's the history of this real estate asset? Like what's, when's the last time the furnace was upgraded? Like when was it replaced? You know, um, we think that making all of that data accessible in the form of a score is gonna help to facilitate decarbonization across America. So we're excited about that. And then we're gonna build um, a blockchain application to help track and store um, all of the information on every building to track, store, and share the information because we want this data to be publicly accessible. Um, and you know, maybe we'll create some carbon credits or something like that off of that data. Um, so there's a lot of benefits to local stakeholders. Um, you know, we think that America is in several crises all at once. Um, we got a financial crisis. We got a climate crisis. We have a civil rights and a jobs crisis and a wealth inequality crisis that's going on. Um, and then we still have the pandemic to be navigated. Um, and so we think that electric building can, um, can impact and uh, help us navigate all of these simultaneous crises. So we're gonna try to green seven US cities. Here it says 36 months. We're gonna actually try to green them in 48 months but we're gonna to try to sign up cities for the next 36 months. So we've signed up Ithaca. Hopefully we can work with you guys to sign up Cambridge. We're gonna be doing some stuff in Menlo Park. We're gonna be doing some stuff in Madison, Wisconsin, maybe Berkeley, a couple other places. And so um, we wanna sign up these cities to participate and kind of race one another to see who can decarbonize first. And again, you guys got some advantages. You should be leaders in this. And I guess if we can do that, if we can decarbonize cities on a 48 year, 48 month time frame, and we can release and open source the data to other cities and other universities around the world, if we can create a template as we decarbonize Ithaca or Cambridge or Menlo Park or the Bronx, if we can create a template and a case study with the engineering data, with the financial data, with the construction data, the public policy information, the inputs and outputs that are necessary in order to decarbonize a city, and we can do that in the next three, four years, then we can release all of that data to the world so that other cities can absorb that data and implement their own sustainability plan using the guidance that that data provides and the lessons learned. And that is our shot at how we mitigate the worst impacts of climate change and how we build public-private partnerships that can give us a shot at um, avoiding uh, blowing past 1.5 degrees um, increase in global temperature. So that's our view. We wanna decarbonize buildings and decarbonize whole cities. And we want leading universities like MIT to help lead the way. So that is my talk. That is explicitly a challenge to all of you at MIT. You guys are some of the most talented and best resource people in the world. And my challenge for you is in the middle of a climate crisis, what are the things that you guys can be doing specifically in Cambridge to decarbonize your campus and to decarbonize the entire city of Cambridge? Because I believe that if you can accomplish that, that other cities will follow your lead and other universities will follow your lead and we can build a movement to decarbonize America. And if we can decarbonize America, as I learned when I was in Scotland last week, um, there's lots of people around the world who continue to look for us for leadership. I talked to sustainability officers in Australia, in India, uh, in, 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 in Glasgow, um, who are leaders around the world and they are looking to us for leadership still. They were very excited about Ithaca. They'd be very excited about Cambridge. And so we want to challenge you all to, um, to rise to that challenge. So with that, thanks for having me. I'll stop sharing my screen and uh, happy, to, happy to engage in questions and conversation.
Well, that's a great, uh, that's a tough moment to follow, Donald. That was uh, fantastic. It was a good pleasure talking to you earlier today and understanding your vision. Um, but this was really comprehensive and clear. Um, so I don't want to talk too much about technology. A lot of the, the platform that you've talked uh, about that has been, I would say, in the making. People have been working on this type of data uh, consolidation for a while. And of course, uh, one of the secret sources will be how do we put it all together and how, how do we link it to the financing? And maybe starting us off, do you see some parallels between what happened in the solar industry? Because if you want like five, six years ago, there are always maps that popped up uh, and they allow you to basically, for just about anywhere in America, look at your address, see what a solar system would cost. And that is basically, it's a platform that brings solar cells to customers and that boosts the sales there. So now my, I think the big question is for solar cells, this works because we know the payback times are really attractive. I think the really uh, remarkable um, component about the thousand projects in the Bronx is usually a filter would not pick these buildings. They are not necessarily the one that if you did a, a cold hearted financial analysis, you would say, let's go for them. So it would be wonderful to hear how do you kind of widen the fields, convince investors to go for these buildings, because of course, once we take uh, the health, as you made a compelling case of the inhabitants into account, these are the buildings that we have to go for. But in terms of pure payback times, they might not be the first one. So I wanted to, uh, would love to hear what you think about that. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I grew up in some of these buildings. I mean, I grew up in a, uh, my family are immigrants. Um, my dad's a mechanical engineer, my mom's a social worker. Um, and so when they moved to America in the 80s, I lived in a, in a very low income building that, that had very inefficient heating and cooling system. And um, so it was important to me that the buildings that I grew up in and where many members of my family still live and where I was a community organizer, it was important to me to figure out how to serve them. So yeah, like there are easier business models that can be built serving more affluent customers. And the Silicon Valley model is to serve affluent customers first. And this is best exemplified, I think, by Tesla. Really expensive Roadster, $125,000 you know, initially for the first wave of Tesla vehicles. Then the price came down for version two to like 70,000, 80,000, something like that. And, and then Elon Musk was very clear like, and then as they gain traction, revenue, operational capabilities, they would drive efficiencies and drive the cost down further to, um, to where they could produce a $30,000 car and sell it to the quote mass market, right? Now, that's a great business model. Um, the challenge is it doesn't meet the needs of the climate crisis, right? Because we got nine years, like if, if we spend a lot of time figuring, you know, we, we just don't have the time. So we have to find a model that allows us to go mass market um, initially. Now we have spent um, six years figuring out how to deal with the lead, the asbestos, the mold, the extra construction costs, the labor unions, the permitting, the utility company, the local government. And how do you put all that together and how do you incorporate that into your software platform so that your software platform is actually accurate and actionable? The interesting thing, Christoph, about solar is, you know, you have satellite data where you can look at the roofs and price the solar systems because you can size the solar systems. You can even look at shading from trees and all that kind of stuff um, with satellite data but you can't use a satellite to look into the basement of a building to see what kind of boiler it is and what size it is and how to replace it. So the question is, what are the ways to, um, to, to use technology and software to build a predictive model that says, well, I can't look into your basement, but based on your building age, you know, when it was built, how it was built, the kinds of materials, it's property tax payment records, it's tax records, you know, what kind of data 
can we organize on this building so that we can make smart deductions about what is going on in that basement so that we can we can we can populate that building's address on a map with a, with a set of predictive data that's accurate enough to be actionable and lead to a green building's transaction with that building owner. And so um, that's one part. So that's a lot of machine learning and the cost of machine learning has come down, fortunately, so that helps us do it. The fact that everybody has a smartphone these days also helps us because we don't have satellite data, but you can send someone with a smartphone down into the basement and collect photos, videos, and some amount of data that can populate a data model and continue to improve it. And then you can stream all of that data to the cloud and store it and analyze it. And so, um, and then of course the internet of things, the fact that the cost of temperature, humidity and pressure sensors can give you a snapshot of what's going on in a basement that you can send somebody to Home Depot with 20 bucks and buy some low cost sensors and put them into the basement and again, start to deduce or induce, I'm not sure what the right one is, but you can start to, to, to draw conclusions around what's going on in that basement through data that's streamed from low cost sensors in that basement. And then that continue to populate your data model and increases your predictive accuracy. And then with each new project that you complete, that project has data, which we capture, and is now in our system and improves the accuracy of the overall predictive model. So the question is how can you, or if you can design a business model where improving the quality and volume of data that you capture is central to the business model. And as you improve the quality and volume of data that you capture, you increase your predictive accuracy. Um, can that kind of business build the kind of tech platform that helps solar to take off? And so our bet is that it can. And in terms of investors, you know, we worked with Goldman and, you know, everyone in Silicon Valley doesn't think our company is going to work, but enough people think that it's going to work, that we're able to raise capital and they're, they're taking a bet that, that we can build out that platform. And so, um, you know, we've been fortunate to find people who are willing to partner with us on that long journey. And a lot of it is gonna come to fruition over the next six months as we build, as we nationalize our data platform. And so that's kind of how we think about that. The last thing I would say from a Goldman Sachs perspective, right? Um, if a building, if an apartment building is spending $100,000 a year on oil and we come in and say, look, we think we can put in heat pumps and the heat pumps are gonna use electricity that costs $75,000 a year. Well, that building's already spending $100,000 a year on oil. So even if it's a low income building, it's been consistently paying $100,000 a year for, for oil. So from Goldman Sachs perspective, if we can actually provide electric heat that's cleaner and affordable for $75,000 to a building that clearly can afford $100,000 a year for oil, then that's an easy project to finance. The, the hard part is organizing all the data in the project to, 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 to make the math work. And so that's what our software does. You know what I find really interesting because we had these two discussions already. Uh, I think what you described here is in a way a very MIT answer that you just gave because people here know about sensors and machine learning and completely I think see the vision. Maybe you can talk a little more about and this is where actually I would wonder how well that works. The human relationship that you have to build so that locals trust you and you put yeah. it into place, right? And that, that is harder to scale because they might know you, uh, might not know you when you are in a completely different city. So how do you think that can work? Yeah, so this is, I mean, look, I'm not a, I'm not a technical founder, right? Like my advantage is our ability to build trust with local communities. I don't need to invent the sensors. I can buy them from some of your students or whatever. It's our ability to build trust at scale. Now, a, my background is presidential politics. I worked for Barack Obama twice as a senior staffer. I worked for John Kerry before that. And a presidential campaign is nothing but trying to build a relationship of trust at scale with 200 million people. Like that, that's what a campaign fundamentally is. Your product is your candidate and 
you want to talk to these 200 million voters about why they should trust your product, this candidate. So there's a set of communications and advertising and grassroots organizing and data modeling and voter profiling and all that kind of thing that allows you to think about what is the best way to build trust with certain kinds of community. If someone has a Tesla already, what's the best way to build trust with them? If someone drives a Ford F-150 pickup truck, what's the best way to build trust with them? So you're gonna have different mechanisms that you use, but you can slice and dice the country and all the people who own buildings into different consumer segments. And you can work on messaging that allows you to build trust um, with each consumer segment. But messages will only get you so far. There has to be a, a, an infrastructure of trust in the way that we do it, which we talked about in the earlier conversation is through these community advisory boards where um, you know every startup or most good startups have a set of advisors who are early people who believe in the idea, but who are credible, who may have built one or two businesses before, they may be professors. And they join the advisory board for the startup and lend it credibility. So we create advisory boards in every region, in every market that we enter. And those advisory boards, we're leveraging the existing trust that has been built up over time with the principal of the school or the head of the library or um, the head of the health clinic that everybody or the lead pastor or rabbi or imam who everyone trusts. We put them on an advisory board. Everyone trusts them. The pastor trusts us enough to join our advisory board. So we are leveraging the existing reservoir of trust that exists in these communities already. And we are moving that reservoir of trust into the field of clean energy. So the question then becomes, how do you combine all your sensors and your technical innovation with this kind of old school model of accessing reservoirs of trust in local American communities. And how do you plan to scale that across America? And so that's, that's what we do. So we, I mean, we have projects in probably 10, 15 states right now. Um, and, you know, fundamentally the, the, the operational process is the same. It's fascinating. It's the rabbi with your app. Uh, I love the combination. I think that's really good. Um, I wanted to bring in two students and we've been filing questions from the audience. If you're participating here, please uh, send us your questions and we'll be ordering maybe if Juliana and Zach could join us and then we basically go around and shoot questions at you from the audience if that works for you. I'm happy to engage happy. further with technology questions, but I think we can leave that at an, uh, to another moment. So uh, if we can, yeah. Uh, a pleasure to introduce Zach Berzola, Juliana Berklund Brown, both students in building technology. Hi, Zach. Hi, Juliana. Hello. Thank you so much. Hi. Let's, Thanks so much. We're going to start with this question How, how have you can overcome the split incentive to convince landlords to invest in these upgrades? I mean, it sounds like a lot of times maybe the landlord is paying the utility bill. Uh, when they're paying $100,000 a year, but how is it when they're not the ones paying the utility bill? How have you managed to convince landlords to make these changes? So if we're gonna save the building $25,000 a year, we're gonna split those savings up between residents and the landlord. And we, we, we buy them off. Money talks, that's great. <laughs> very Yeah, very simple. Awesome, thanks. Um, I was wondering if you could talk more um, about uh, going beyond other types of, of building uses as well. So like, what, for example, what about municipal buildings like school and city office buildings? Um, and, and shouldn't every city in the country be electrifying their schools and then putting the savings back into a city budget? And I was wondering if you could speak to a specific case of a school building um, that you have retrofitted. Yeah, I mean, we, we retrofit um, school buildings. They're complicated and they're very competitive. There's lots of big engineering firms and labor unions are involved in school buildings and it's like all very complicated. And so, you know, anytime you do a school, they want you to do like a giant RFP and then they, you know, it's like a whole thing. Um, so it actually is quite a painful process 
to get permission to decarbonize a school, unfortunately. We have seen horrible things in schools, Juliana. We've seen, we actually had a four-year-old die of a, an asthma attack that we um, discovered was caused by the oil burning boiler in the school, um, which was you know, causing indoor air pollution and then funneling the pollution into the school cafeteria. So every day the kids would like go eat lunch and then they'd all have asthma attacks. And then you know, one day a kid died, right? And it was because of the architecture or it was because of all the neglect in the ventilation and energy systems in the school, right? Um, there are other schools that don't have air conditioning. There are schools that don't have heat. Um, in Jersey City, you know, like the schools don't have any air conditioning and then a rich parent like bought them air conditioners but they couldn't figure out how to install them. So the air conditioners are in a closet but the kids are like, still trying to learn, but there's no air conditioning. Um, in Baltimore, uh, the school froze. And so um, they had like 50 schools a year or two ago that the kids came to school, the heat wasn't working because everything had frozen over. So they like kept their jackets on all day. And then they had to call the school buses to come back and take them home. And of course their parents were at work. And this is like the nation's schools are a nightmare, right? They have lead, they have asbestos, they have mold. There are schools in Baltimore where you can't drink the water from the water fountain because they have lead. Um, you know, these are major American cities that are public, you know, publicly funded schools. And it's quite the mess. The other part of schools is like they're funded through like local property taxes or something like that and so the renovations have to like be approved by the property tax it's just it's just a nightmare um but yeah all the schools should def definitely decarbonize um we are in the process of decarbonizing a few um it is unfortunate that um the infrastructure bill like there's only so much they can do right because schools aren't uh, funded by the federal government and renovations aren't necessarily funded. So local cities have to decide um, to decarbonize their schools and it's like a quagmire. I think because you guys are at MIT, that's something you could do. Like you guys could write a letter to all the principals in America being like, hey, if you get stimulus money to your city, like you should decarbonize your school. What we really like about decarbonizing schools obviously all the kids are there. If you put in air quality sensors and measure the nonsense that all the toxins that the kids are breathing in, like every, like I have a six year old, like every parent is gonna be outraged when they see data on what their kid's school is making their kid breathe in every day. And once that data is shared with parents, like they will green and decarbonize that school in a heartbeat. The question is, how do you get the data to the schools, right? And how do you get the sensors in the schools and all that kind of stuff? So um, I think there's a way to do it. Um, I will say that um, it is complicated because of the public municipal procurement of the way that schools are set up in, in the country and the fact that there's giant engineering firms like Amoresco, like Jonathan Controls, and they have great business models where they quote, they are greening schools now um, and they're making millions of dollars doing it. I mean, the schools aren't green, obviously, but the, the, the way the industry is set up um, allows Amoresco and Johnson Control and these big engineering firms to win contracts where they have advantages, they have political relationships, lobbyists, all that kind of stuff. And so it's hard to like break, you know, Re remove the schools from the vice grip of incumbents who continue to fail um, our nation's children. So it's, it's heartbreaking, really. I don't know what to tell you, Juliana. Next question. <laughs> but yeah, we work in schools. And um, the, the cool thing about heat pumps is like when you put, when you put um, ductless mini split all electric heat pumps into a school, you can actually put a unit in every classroom. And so a lot of the efficiencies come because if a class isn't in session, you can turn it off. You can adjust the comfort to the individual needs of that room. So as you decentralize the energy system in a school in particular, there's a lot of advantages in terms of comfort, health, 
um, as well as greenhouse gas emissions and energy savings that are generated in schools in particular because of the classroom-based nature of the school. And so it's just a massive, massive opportunity that needs a lot of brain power um, to figure it out. Great, thank you. Maybe talk about- That wasn't a very hopeful answer, I apologize. <laughs> Galvanizing answer. Maybe talking about brain power and training people. So uh, I think heat pumps uh, are a great start. They electrify, and I would say the knowledge is largely out there. We are talking a lot how to install them. We are talking a lot about you know the next step, the insulating walls and so forth. And that seems to be for many a hard nut to crack because it's it's harder to to tell you beforehand what's in the walls. How do I upgrade the walls? Do you ever get involved in, in insulation projects? You mentioned it, but I think you are focused a lot of the, your talk on heat pumps. Yeah, we do. We do insulation in every project that we do. We, we figure it out. We calculate the U value of the what's going on the wall. We use temperature sensors, um, not in every project, but in many of our projects, we'll use temperature sensors or calculate the delta. Mm -hmm. um, of temperature delta T at different parts of the building, right? And so as heat moves from the combustion boiler throughout the pipes into the building, is emitted into a room and then lost through the building facade or windows, you can calculate all that, the heat loss ratio and the U value of walls. You can back into it through distributed temperature data is right. I mean, I'm, I'm sure you guys know about all yeah. this stuff. So how, how do you train then your workforce to do this? How do you train a workforce? We estimated just for the US, uh, we would need a quarter million green jobs or uh, people that would insulate all US single family homes because that knowledge isn't out there. How should that happen? So we, I mean, we think that, um, I mean, right now we, we, we've hired seven or 800 um, vulnerable young people in the Bronx who um, are ex-offenders at risk of gun violence, um, you know, at risk. And so we're training them comprehensively on uh, heat pumps, as well as insulation, as well as augmented reality, construction processes or give them a construction hat with a camera on top of it and they walk around and capture the building in augmented reality. It's a, you know, the question is how do you prepare a workforce? Not that's like narrow and you're like, hey, you learn to do electrical work. You learn to do Wi-Fi and broadband work so you can close the digital divide. Hey, you learn how to do hazardous materials removal. And hey, you learn how to do insulation. But how do you actually train a workforce given that we have a, a shortage of skilled workers across America, across all of these categories, how do you train what we're calling a smart buildings tech or a green buildings tech, a worker who can show up and do all of the um, assessment and upgrades that are necessary on their work crew with their colleagues in order to ensure that the building is comprehensively trained. So we do, we do train people on how to put in insulation um, there are a range of workforce development organizations across the country. There's the community colleges. Um, but in addition to that, America's labor unions, while they don't enjoy the collaborative strategic relationship that German labor unions have with the business sector in Germany, um, in the construction industry, there are parts of the construction industry that have a synergistic relationship between construction firms and contractors. Sorry, between construction firms, contractors, and construction labor unions. And many American labor unions actually own training facilities that are the size of community colleges. So if you drive out to uh, Queens in New York, or Delaware County outside of Philadelphia. Um, I don't know exactly where it is in Boston, but you guys are a union town. So they're, they're giant union training facilities where you can train thousands of workers. The unions have instructors on staff. They have curriculum on how to train workers in all of the cutting edge curriculum. And so the question is, 
is there a way to redesign the American labor model given the shortage of skilled construction workers and given the vast amount of money coming from the federal government, can you redesign the workforce development and training model in America so that we can um, train the hundreds of thousands of workers that we need? So that's one. Two, we are working with the Biden team to help them think through what does it look like to actually create a civilian climate core this is based on the idea Franklin Delano Roosevelt during the Great Depression hired able-bodied Americans to like plant trees, paint stuff, do art, you know, whatever. Um, begin the foundations to build the American highway system. What does it look like to hire several hundred thousand young Americans who are alarmed about climate change commit to working on it for two to three years and then you train them to go building to building to do assessments and installations of what is needed, including insulation. And so I think that um, I think that the workforce development will the workforce development will be there when the demand for the green buildings is there. It is it is a solvable problem. Next question. <laughs> Maybe. Uh, kind of building off that, you touched on on, on the administration and, and federal funding to support some of these uh, some of this work. I mean, where, where do you see the federal government? Where do you see the greatest gaps that the federal government can fill in terms of helping to support the decarbonization of buildings around the country? Yeah, the upfront costs need a subsidy, um, and so you can you know in order to look in order if a building's burning a hundred thousand dollars worth of oil every year. And we're going to reduce that cost to seventy-five thousand dollars worth of electricity every year. We still have the installation cost of putting the heat pumps in, which for a building that's burning a hundred thousand dollars is probably north of seven hundred thousand dollar project up front. And so, where does the money for that upfront cost come from? And if you have to take $25,000 of savings and figure out how to repay $700,000, right? That's a 28 year payback, right? And so that's too long. That's a mortgage. Nobody really wants to finance that. So you do want some amount of tax credits and federal subsidy to bring down that upfront cost from 700,000 to like 350,000 or 400,000 until such time as we can get efficiencies from software, from financing, from our new workforce that we're all gonna train over the next few years to lower prices, um, the, the price of the upfront cost. So we need the, we need the federal government to subsidize um, the upfront cost. There's about 200, $200 billion of subsidies for upfront costs for buildings in both in both bills. Um, when you look at the when you look at the bipartisan package that passed and the reconciliation bill that we hope will pass, fingers crossed, there's about $200 billion um, for upgrading buildings. So we need that to subsidize the upfront cost. Now it would be a mistake to not take that federal dollar and leverage it with three or $4 of private sector money for every single dollar that comes from the federal government. That would be a mistake. And so when I testified to the Senate or whatever about this stuff, what I said is for every dollar that the federal government spends, we need to get three to $4 from Goldman and from Wall Street in order to, to, to turn $1 into $5 so that we can, um, attack this problem at scale. And so um, if we can get the bill through, um, there, there, there are some measures for that. Thank you. So I'm, I'm curious in, in your work, um, both in, in establishing partnerships between um, the tech industry and finance industry, if you've uh, experience challenges in applying environmental justice principles to your work and then also to that end when thinking about this framework of using community partners to build trust how do you align uh, building trust with trust with community partners and then also general distrust distrust of big tech firms 
in your work and just if you've experienced any having to to deal with that balance yeah i mean facebook has a connectivity platform called teragraph and um you know they actually can shoot microwave microwaves you know signals into urban apartment buildings so you can have a facebook telegraph antenna on like uh, a church tower and then shoot internet into the windows of a low-income apartment building across the street right and so during the pandemic you know i was like there's a digital divide facebook has this technology they have resources they want to be helpful maybe there's a few cities where we can partner with them and deploy this technology the challenge is Facebook is not viewed as a partner that's gonna like take good care of your data by many community partners. I'll reserve my own comments. And you are unable to leverage the kind of trust that you need um, with through a partnership with Facebook. So just because the hardware is there, like they're 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 like not the right partner for for many community groups and many local governments um don't don't view them as a trustworthy partner in terms of data privacy um and security and all that kind of stuff and so we we ran into significant challenges um when we kind of broached the idea of partnering with facebook and you do that too many times and then you lose your own trust trusted relationships with the community because they feel like you're trying to shove Silicon Valley stuff down their throat and that that doesn't align with their values, right? So part of it is, you know, you have to have solutions and partnerships that are aligned with the values of the communities as best you can. And, and then when you can't, you got to say, look, we're in a pandemic. This is the way that I can provide you guys internet so your kids can learn remotely. I don't have another way of doing it. And so if it's not gonna be Facebook, then it's gotta be Google or, or nothing. And then the community has to make a choice and that's a hard call. But by being transparent with, with the community about the hard choices that they have to make, normally people step up and make the best decisions that make the most sense to them, right? And so if you treat the community as a true partner and follow their guidance, instead of treating them like, you know, actors who can't um, make their own decisions, um, that that is one item. I mean, I think I wouldn't say that Wall Street and Silicon Valley prioritize environmental justice as like part of their core hypothesis about the future of the world. And, um, you know, we've had to share a bunch of data with them around the fact that, look, there's money, there's billions of dollars to be made solving the problems of environmental justice um, in the way that the energy system is structured. We make the argument that as the energy system becomes more decentralized, just like social media has become decentralized or supercomputing used to be something that you would do in the basement at MIT in a giant room. And now it's something that any kid can do in a credit card size supercomputer in their pocket. energy is gonna be decentralized. And so as energy becomes decentralized, there's gonna be a lot of money to be made. And as energy becomes decentralized, we sh should um, invest in remediating environmental injustice and make that a core um, business principle of, of, of how we do business in a new decentralized energy environment. So that's how we think about it. And the business partners that we have agree with us but it still is incumbent upon us to, to make the financial case that there's gonna be money to be made um, by, by providing environmental justice. And so even our, most, even our most social justice warrior investors, they still wanna see, hey, Danelle, where's the revenue, right? Like, we're, 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 you know, but once, once, I, once we show them that there's revenue to be had, they're even willing to accept slightly lower returns, right? And so our company will provide venture-like returns to our early stage investors, and we have had venture-like growth. But even if we did not, um, 
you know, some growth, some ability to provide financial returns to investors at all while delivering environmental justice. Um, that, that seems to be something that, that's been a, a narrow path that we've been able to walk. Maybe following up on what you just said. So you gave us the task to renovate 5,000 homes in Cambridge because that's our home, that's an affluent city. You are doing a great job in Ithaca, starting to do the same thing. These are cities that have relatively high incomes. And of course there's an income distribution, but uh, if you look at the average, I, I think part of your, your business appeal is to say, if we're doing enough buildings, there's an averaging out. And if the average of a community is high enough, then the income is there. So do these approaches then scale to everywhere in the US or what are we doing, maybe projecting out a bit? What do we do when we've done the Cambridges and the Ithacas of the US? Can we go anywhere? Because there are just, I just maintain there are neighborhoods, there are buildings where it's, it's not economical and still these are the most important ones and we have to do it. Yeah, so Ithaca has a 20% of Ithaca is in poverty. Um, I don't think that's the case in Cambridge, but it is the case in Ithaca. Um, and then, as I mentioned in my presentation, the Bronx, where we have you know hundreds of projects that we've worked on, um, is the poorest congressional district in America, and we have served you know hundreds of buildings in the Bronx, right? So. From our perspective, we have figured out how to serve these buildings using Wall Street money and Silicon Valley uh, capital and technology. I think the question is, the question about greening Cambridge is, we should green Cambridge quickly because we can, because it is affluent and because you are there. But the, the operational muscle and the case study and the, the operational insight that's built up from decarbonizing Cambridge will make it easier to decarbonize Lawrence. I mean, that's, that's the hypothesis, right? Like in, in decarbonizing America, it's a new industry. We need new workers. We need new financial products. We need new sources of data. We need new applications on top of the data right? Everything's new. It's a new industry. And so like Elon Musk selling uh, the $110,000 road, Tesla Roadster, you know, as we decarbonize cities, we are going to build up some infrastructure by decarbonizing the cities that are ready to go first. And I do believe that the data, the financial returns, but really the construction workforce that needs to be built, which is the most important part of this, is that to green any city in America, there has to be a new workforce. And so then the question becomes, where's the easiest place to develop a new workforce? And that is where there's demand for decarbonization services. And so if we can aggregate enough demand at the city scale to justify investing $20 million in developing a new workforce, which is what we're doing in New York City. We have like a 20 or $30 million you know, project to, uh, to hire eight or 900 workers who we're training. Then you build up that workforce as a cohort and we can send them into the Bronx. We can also send them to the Upper West Side of Manhattan. We can send them to Staten Island. We can send them to rich and poor neighborhoods alike because that workforce is trained to navigate whatever they encounter in a building, right? And so if a building has a luxury swimming pool, we can figure out how to decarbonize that building. If a building has a bunch of lead and asbestos, we can figure out how to decarbonize that building. And so the hard part is building up the workforce. And so if you do that in Ithaca first, then we can take that workforce and go into, you know, South Boston and Lawrence and all that kind of stuff. So that's, that's our hypothesis. The workers are how this gets done. Yeah, no, I completely agree. Uh, we are nearly at 7.20 and I'm being told that I'm supposed to hand you over. We are all supposed to hand you over to our chair, uh, Professor Nicholas de Moncho. Donald was an enormous pleasure talking to you. I think there's an incredible amount of vision there and can't wait to see what you are going to accomplish and hopefully some of us can help you and work with you in the process. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much.
So good evening, everyone. Um, I'm delighted to cl close out this lecture and with it close out our lecture series this fall. Um, I look forward uh, uh, in particular to uh, having you all join us next semester where amongst other things, our commitment, excuse me, to design and research will include a very relevant joint studio with our partners at DUSP uh, that it, uh, addresses many of the local questions just raised in this discussion, in particular, what kind of city the Climate Corps can help us create. The studio will be led by Miha Mazaru in architecture, working with Mariana Campo at DUSP and DesignX's social entrepreneur in residence, Green City Force co-founder Lisbeth Shepard. So stay tuned for that discussion. Maybe we can even get Danelle back for it as well, um, as well as many more next semester. Tonight, however, uh, I thank you all for joining us for this semester's continuing set of conversations on where we are now. Echoing this series' first announcement, I can say that we have confronted visionary symbolism, extraordinary mechanics, decolonial maneuvers, new methods of computational craft, situated technologies and design research, spaceships in the desert, conversations on care, the power of defined op optimism, and most importantly, the capacity of design, culture, research, and technology together to transform cities and communities. We've engaged each other in the world, as always in the search for architecture's role in helping us both understand the world and transform it at the same time. Thank you for joining us this evening and we look forward to seeing you next semester when our lectures will continue to be broadcast on all the channels you're enjoying this one on tonight. Thanks to Danelle, thanks to our students and faculty and thanks to all of you for joining and supporting our mission. Good night.